Cool. Welcome everyone. Um, we're looking at staff competency today uh, and I'll work through the slides as per normal and then we'll have some breaks for some questions and, and time, lots of time for questions at the end hopefully as well um, and uh, go through a few bits and pieces. So staff competence. Uh, just the same as always, um, if you stay on mute, but uh, we're a reasonably small group today, so feel free um, in any breaks just to pop off mute and ask some questions, uh, and we'll make sure we have time for questions at the end as well. Um, again, just a reminder uh, to check uh, whether your school's on the National, Incident, uh, National EOTC Coordinator Database. Um, and encourage all of those schools um, around you to make sure they're on the coordinator database as well. I'll show you the button to um, direct them to uh, later on. Uh, also, if you've got any links into primary schools, um, that's an area where um, there seems to be lots of primary schools that don't have uh, EOTC coordinator or the senior leader in charge. Um, registered on the database. So any support in getting those um, neighbouring primary schools you, or your contributing schools um, onto that database would be really appreciated. Uh, overarching messages you know, that goes across all of these Zoom sessions, uh, all about understanding um, what you're doing and why you're doing it, making sure what you're doing is current or is doing the same jobs as the current tools are. Um, and that's uh, both the safety management system template and the toolkit. And then just making sure that everyone in the activity understands um, what's in place, how to implement it, and how to monitor it as you go along. So looking at staff competency today and different ways um, we might measure that and what we need to consider. So key here, um, staff competency is hugely important uh, to the quality of the EOTC that your school delivers. Uh, really important that the staff have the competency to understand the policies and procedures and how to implement those and the importance of implementing them. Um, that they're aware of uh, things that might change the level of risk during the activity and that they can spot those hazards that come up during activities and then effectively manage them. Um, that kind of eye for risk management and picking out things that are hazardous that happen during the event. Um, and that they have the competency to do that within a dynamic environment. Um, that's very different from being in the classroom. Um, I think every school has fantastic classroom teachers that we know just um, don't function so well in dynamic EOTC environments. It's just not their thing. Um, so being aware of who those people are and how you can support them um, to still be able to deliver EOTC, but in a safe way. And then that the staff also have the competencies to deal with the emergencies that might come up, uh, that they can respond calmly and follow your procedures in those high pressure, um, very changeable situations. Um, so really, competent staff equals quality, qu uh, quant quality EOTC. Um, so how do you ensure you've got the right staff um, delivering your different EOTC experiences? Um, the, the best thing in, from my point of view is actually starting with the different activities that you deliver. So rather than starting with the person, um, start with the activities that you're doing. And that removes um, assumptions that you might make, like, oh, they'll be fine, they've been running that for years. Um, if you start by looking at the activities, then all of those things just get put to the side around the person that's doing it, and you can look really objectively at the activity and the level of risk and, comp and um, complexity of that activity. It also means that you can do this as one piece of work 
um, either you know, at the start of the year or at the end of the year, if you've got a little bit more time then, um, just on the activities that you're likely to have during the year. Also helps with consistency. If you're looking at all of the activities at the same time, you're more likely to uh, put a consistent lens over your evaluation of those activities. Uh, and then you can quickly add in a new activity if it comes up during the year, because you've already kind of got a framework of where different activities sit and what they might require. Um, I always tell schools to start with a big whiteboard, um, make a list of all the activities that they do or are likely to do, and then start to look at categorizing those by the level of risk or the complexity involved in that activity. Once you've got your big list, then you can start considering what competencies might be required uh, for each of those activities and then how you might judge staff against those competencies. Uh, qualifications is probably the uh, easiest way to be able to judge a person as um, competent, the things that are being assessed by that qualification. And I'll, the next slide talks a little bit more to that as well. Uh, professional development, learning, training, um, what's needed for that particular activity? Uh, for example, um, the induction process, uh, training on the school's EOTC policies, procedures. Does that activity need the staff, mem or staff members to be trained in um, driving in gravel or on a ski field road or towing a trailer? So really looking at what training each um, activity might need. And then what experience would you expect um, a leader to have for that particular activity? And also it's good to think about what experience an assistant or someone else that isn't the leader um, on the activity might need as well. And then also considering kind of the relevant knowledge and skills, student management skills uh, and skills that relate to the particular activity that you're going on. All of those things together, that's the big picture of what's required for that activity. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about qualifications now, and I'm just going to switch out of this screen to show you where some things actually are. So just hold fire for a second. So hopefully you can see a new view now. Um, the first thing uh, about is sort of what are industry expectations for those particular activities that you're running. So if the activity was being delivered commercially, what would be expected of the staff members running it? And that's a good benchmark to understand and then think about um, when you're thinking about the competencies and qualifications that your staff might um, need to be able to uh, run that activity. And there's some things that can guide us um, in making those decisions. Um, this is a supported venture website. It's where the good practice guidelines sit. Um, and we're gonna just navigate our way in there now. So there's two things that are relevant in here. And um, we'll go in and have a look at a good practice guide in a minute. But also there's uh, these activity safety guidelines for adventure activities. Now these are um, higher risk activities that are captured by the activity, adventure activities regulations. Um, a number of those um, have particular guidelines and in there they will talk about the relevant qualifications for running that activity. So these guidelines in there for Absail, um, alpine hiking, canyoning, caving, coasting, diving, indoor climbing, mountain biking, and whitewater rafting, high wires, and swings. There's also heli guiding, but unlikely that you'll be needing that guideline um, in schools. The ones that you are more likely to um, need, and it's really good to have a look at, are these good practice guidelines. If we pop in here now, um, there's a number of um, activities that uh, have good practice guidelines. Um, they're being developed all of the time. 
um, this big list here. There's two parts to most of them. And um, one is a planning template that looks very like uh, the um, risk assessment and supervision EOTC form. But the one that has the information um, that we're looking at today um, is in the good practice guidelines part. There's also um, up here, and we'll go into this first, some generic guidance for all activities. And if we pop into here, um, lots of good stuff. But what we're looking for today is the leader competency. And this just asks a bunch of questions um, when you get to um, thinking about the person that is going to be leading the activity and the um, competencies they might have. And there's some good things in here um, to check against. The other part. Um, that we'll look at more closely today. Um, I'm going to pick overnight camping. So again, in here, all of the sections that were in the generic guidance are basically replicated in here with the particular things for overnight camping. Lots of good information in here, but if we go down to leader competence, um, you can see there's some key questions here about what a leader might need, particularly to run overnight camping. And then also some recommendations or qualifications to consider uh, when you're looking at overnight camping. Those are qualifications that have a component of overnight camping in them. If we have a look now at the um, organisations that deliver those qualifications, um, we can look first at uh, NISOIL, the Outdoor Instructors Association, and we can find information about their qualifications uh, by following a little trail. Um, we'll look at Bush, seeing that's the theme we started on. Um, and you can see they've got different levels of qualifications listed here. We'll start with the level four qualification. And this will take us to what the qualification actually contains. And there's a couple of really um, good things to look at in here. Kind of tells you a little bit about what a holder of um, this qualification would be like. Um, and then it also tells you what the scope of the qualification is. So this is really helpful when you're trying to work out, hmm, I'm going to do a short walk up to Mount Roberts Summit, um, going in summer. Um, and you can see that if you're doing that type of trip, then this is the kind of qualification or, or the skills that would be expected of a leader um, running that trip. And then if you scan down even further, it has the actual scope of the qualification, what people are expected to be able to do. And if the person um, you are thinking could run this trip um, doesn't hold this qualification, this is really useful um, for you to get your head around what the skills are for that particular activity. The other, and then oh, if we go back, um, there's a whole more. And this is where I have a qualifications across a reasonably large range of um, areas. Not all, um, of course, but uh, a range. And then if we look at skills active, um, we can find their qualifications in here. Under outdoors. And then let's pick uh, bushwalking again. Sticking with level four, um, here you want to look at the program structure and that will tell you the unit standards that make up that particular qualification, which is exactly the same as the Nazoya qualification we just looked at. Um, here you can go and delve into the unit standards to get that kind of scope level um, of information. So there's a handy little link here that'll take you to the bushwalking 
unit standards and then you can just click on the unit standard to see exactly what's involved in that. Um, and it's a good way to get information around what skills are really required for that particular activity. Again, it's kind of got a bit of a definition about the terrain or the scope um, that this qualification uh, covers in each unit standard. All right, are there any questions um, around that bit? There's quite a bit of information there, I know. Carl. It's, it's, sorry, it's actually Dave. I don't know why oh. I've come up with Carl. Sorry, sorry, Fiona. <laughs> no problem. Um, You're just trying to confuse me. Yeah, I know. See Carl across there. Well, this is a great topic for confusion. Um, I've been reading through the EOTC guidelines, you know, bringing the curriculum alive documentation. And it states in there that good practice standards indicate that a qualification where available is taken you know in terms of competency uh, but you can do attestation you can do equivalence yeah. ultimately though if if heaven forbid something goes wrong on a trip we're going to end up in court under the health and safety act which states that best practice must be followed now from my understanding if the Health and Safety Act is saying best practice must be followed and the EOTC guidelines are saying that good practice slash best practice is to have a qualification, that means that we've got to have a qualification. It's certainly... It's a bit uh, ambiguous. Sorry, I'm just... Yeah, yeah the, the legal no. language. And, and I'm, a, I'm a school principal, so I know that if anything goes wrong my behind is going to be in front of lawyers in a court. Yes, yeah. that is, that's very true. And yeah. um, it is a really good question. Um, certainly the easiest path is to have the qualifications mm. where, where you're talking about this sort of level of activity. Yeah. Very different to you know, a whole bunch of EOTC where these types of qualifications aren't. Um, you know, are really appropriate. Um, although Skills Active do have the EOTC strand um, in their qualifications, which um, is really appropriate for um, schools, particularly EOTC coordinators. Yeah. But um, I think it's definitely the easiest way to hold that to hold a qualification. Um, but the EOTC guidelines, I think, have given schools. Um, leeway to have other systems um, in place and look at uh, the relevant experience that teachers hold but you you would it would be good practice to have a robust system around how you've done that mm. so that you you can demonstrate yes I've looked at what's expected of a level four um, bush leader uh, and I've gone through a process of assessing my staff member against that criteria. Yeah. Uh, they've gone out with um, a Bush One qualified person and, and they've looked at all of these, um, all of the points and said, yes, they can do that. Yeah. Um, okay, but you, you understand where I suppose, I'm sorry for being pedantic here. Oh, I absolutely um, understand where you're coming from. That even if we go on an overnight camp, a low level, doesn't even have to be in the bush camp, um, there are qualifications that enable people to take overnight camps. Heaven forbid something goes wrong and, you know, worst case scenario, we lose a student. Um, if none of those staff have got qualifications, they're not following best practice under the Health and Safety Act. Yeah, I think it's making a judgment about where qualifications are really appropriate and right. don't have them having a really robust system in place. Um, so if you're looking at that example um, of your school camp, you know, who else is going 
what does the whole competency picture look like rather than just um, each, pers each individual person. Um, I think we are going down a qualifications pathway and uh, it's good to, for schools to look at how they might um, implement getting staff trained for, particular, for these particular activities um, that have this level of qualification. Um, where the expectation is if you went to a commercial provider that they any staff that were running that activity for the commercial provider would have these qualifications. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bridget. Bridge. Hi, I uh, just want to say, I guess for some people, um, so Skills Active Level 4 is the equivalent of the Enzoia Bush Leader, and how, how it goes differently is Bush Leader, so a leader level qualification with Enzoia has a very designated scope, and as you go up the levels, the, the scope is very designated, so for example, Bush Leader is, like, there is someone else who they can report to, um, who's kind of got their overall um, understanding of everything so it's very it's very I guess contained so they're inside the the property boundaries of whatever um, once you move to level one you can use an increasing range of sites and locations but again it's still a bit prescriptive once you get to Enzoia level two that means that people have the experience judgment and have shown competence to be able to take a group of people to an area they haven't been to before so just just so you kind of know and um yeah so level four level five level six that's all cool oh, thanks bridge pamela um i'm after dave's comment i'm now feeling quite nervous because <laughs> it was dave right not carl yeah <laughs> um because our camp's been uh cancelled obviously due to lockdown and we've managed to reschedule um a new location but it's only accommodation so we're now looking at running our own activities with you know the help of you know hiring kayaks etc so without any qualified teachers because i know that the teachers that will be accompanying our students and not what don't have any of those qualifications um i'm now quite nervous about this whole prospects we're having to run our own activities and use our own equipment um, in a location that is close to water so we're doing water activities and I, I did your last PD in terms of you know looking at competency and looking planning for the emergency and forgetting about ratios etc but I'm actually now quite nervous in terms of the fact that we don't have any official qualifications and yet we are running overnight camp by ourselves. Yeah I think um, you really need to look carefully at the activities that you're doing and the competencies that those staff running the activities are doing, particularly um, those activities where um, emergency situations um, have short response times, um, like water, um, you know, I really would suggest that um, you want either very competent um, staff involved or you're looking to support that activity with an external qualified person, uh, or you're thinking about, is that an activity that you really need to run? Is there something that your staff are competent um, to run um, that could have the same outcomes? Mm. Um, and I guess that's a, a push from Eons's point of view around looking at what activities are really happening on school camps um, and getting schools to question those activities so that the staff um, who see the kids before and after camp um, can have the most input they can. So finding activities that staff are competent at running that don't necessarily need these high level qualifications um, and don't have uh, such dire um, emergency possibilities. You know, the, as soon as you're talking about um, kayaking and water mm. you know, and you're looking at possibilities of um, having to deal with getting kids out of boats and managing them in a water situation, then you really need to be considering um, competencies around uh, either from surf lifesaving, um, lifeguarding out of a pool situation, although 
that depends on what water you're using or um, some of these outdoor qualifications uh, in the kayaking um, realm. Might not. <laughs> Hopefully that answers that question. I might cancel the kayak kayak now then. <laughs> 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 or, or look in your parent body. You might be surprised who's out in your parent body holding qualifications mm. um, and competency or who you can find around your local area um, that you can bring in. If that's the activity that you really um, want to run and there's no other way to get those learning outcomes. Um, mm. it, it's a balancing act between having um, meeting the kind of expectations of the wider outdoor sector around what is the appropriate competency and how to make judgments on that um, without putting unnecessary um, barriers in place. But we always want to keep our kids safe. Yeah. Oh, um, so the other thing to consider in, oh, Bridget, Bridget. Pam, I was just going to say the other thing okay, that you've got. Oh, okay. I'll put it down. Um, Pamela, if you want to think about whether they sit on top kayaks and what depth of water you're in, and, and, and um, don't get put off. This is the bit that I hate is people go, oh, I'm scared and stuff. It's like if you just have really strict, um, you know, there's a clear lesson plan and everyone knows this is the progression we go through and engaging the kids. This is why we wear a life jacket. This is this. And, you know, that kind of make it a game but explain to them you're accountable you've got to help your buddy and go through those kind of things it's like and if you have sit on top kayaks that kind of then changes things um if it's an inland water setting thinking about you know whether the wind's going to blow them away and stuff like that so don't be put off running it because it's like you can do it but it's just having a, a progression depending on the age of your kids and um, offering a safe experience for them like yeah so you know don't don't cancel it. Don't cancel it. It's like yeah, just think about the progression and and making it fun and stuff. Like you know, I kayak flat water and then I teach white water kayaking. But it's like we we don't go into the white water until we've mastered the the flat water stuff and there's clear progressions and. I don't know how long your camp's for, but whether they're in groups of 10 and there's someone on the land who's helping everyone get their gear sorted and maybe there's buddies, like there's different ways of doing it, but it's just having a structure that'll work for you. And you're going, yes, I'm comfortable here, you know, and these people understand what we're doing. Because I think often we want to try and teach so much and it's about the experience of getting out there and, you know, just falling out of the kayak and, you know, overcoming the fear or helping your buddy launch their boat. So, yeah, don't shy away from the kayaking, but maybe there's options around sit on top kayaks and things like that. Yeah. Have, have a look in the uh, good practice guide for floating activities yeah. and that'll give you some guidance. Okay. Thank well. you. Go. Uh, first aid qualifications and driver's licenses are the other qualifications you need to consider. Uh, with first aid, um, again, there's a whole range of qualifications there. So exactly the same thing. Um, find the qualification that matches the level of activity you're doing um, and, and keep that relevant. Um, you know, the most basic workplace um, first aid is probably appropriate for anything around town. Um, whereas if you're you know, going alpine tramping, um, then you might want to consider a higher level of first aid qualification in there. So thinking about how you might bring all this information together, um, you can do it, you know, just create some sort of database, really. Uh, whichever system works for you. Um, here's a little example. Um, it's just an Excel sheet. doesn't need to be overly complicated. Um, and you can see... You know, what faculty it is, uh, what type of activity, where it is, um, where a qualification is required. And obviously this is an outdoor um, education or the outdoor education part of the um, PE and health faculty. Um, so it does have a lot of qualifications listed there. Uh, and you can see the range of first aid qualifications as well. And then um, there's some work on what experience might be um, required as well as the qualification to build that entire competency picture um, because 
a, even holding a qualification doesn't tick off um, the entire um, competency picture required. You see here like the site visit, super important um, um, for all of these um, activities. Um, so just thinking about um, then how you use this information in approving your activities. So you're looking at, uh, you've worked out the competency requirements for the activity, and now you need to match that to the competencies of those staff that are listed. Do the two sets um, match? Okay. Um, are there gaps that you need to fill? Um, and then thinking about how you fill those, whether you can fill them off other staff members um, within your school or whether it's actually getting some external e expertise and you know, going out to your parent body to see if you can find that or out to find an instructor or a provider that can deliver that for you. Even if it's just the first time you run that particular activity, having that external expertise, if you're feeling that you don't have enough expertise within the school. When you're looking at the staff that are listed in the supervision structure, you also want to be thinking about um, them now as individuals and their decision making and judgment capabilities, and also how um, their student management uh, skills fit in with the dynamic situations and the level of activity you're thinking about. You know, whether the students are actually likely to follow their instructions or not um, in that environment. Uh, that matching process and this information is a, a hugely vital um, part of the approval process. Um, and it is really important um, to be mindful in that process and not just make assumptions, um, you know, because someone's been doing it forever. Uh, it's easy to make those assumptions that they're doing it the right way. Um, so it is really important to be thoughtful and to do it in a systematic um, way where your decisions are being supported by um, this information and um, that it's all also, uh, there's some kind of documentation process behind how you're making those um, decisions. Uh, one way, um, well, what um, I have done here is I've actually done that matching exercise uh, before the approvals or before any application comes in. Um, so you can see I've just matched up staff in the department um, with those particular activities, whether they can lead, whether they can assist. Uh, and then if there's contractors that um, I might work with, whether um, I've just listed those in there that are able to lead as well. So that's one way of um, capturing that information. When you're doing it for a whole school, um, it's often better to do it to capture your staff information separately from the activity information. And I'm planning to talk more about that uh, in the next session, which is on staff induction and training and looking at how you might kind of capture and manage this information ongoing. Uh, whether it's as simple as an Excel sheet or hopefully uh, it might be your student management system or the system that you use to capture the rest of your staff information or personnel information. Um, yeah, so that'll be next session. Now, just a couple of wee points in, on um, our website. Uh, click on this big button here to find the EOTC database. If you go into our website live, you'll be able to click down here now and find their updated uh, EOTC at alert level two guidance um, and click through to that. Um, it's just, just went live at about 15 minutes before this started um, out of the ministry. Well, got approval from the ministry um, about 10 minutes before that. So it's up there for you um, to help guide uh, those of us that are in level two um, deliver EOTC. 
if you go through and um, click through to the EOTC management page, um, the Zoom series uh, sits in here and that's where you can register for the next one. Uh, the good practice guides that we looked at, there's a link to those there. There's the national um, database. And you will also find in here at the moment is the EOTC through COVID alert levels. It's actually sitting in here. Um, at the moment, and that's where the new guidance is, but also links through to all of the ministry guidance um, on COVID alert levels. Uh, so, any final questions? Cool. Um, as Bridge said, uh, Try not to be overwhelmed by this, but it is a really important process to go through. Um, and then it's weighing up and looking at making that match between the competencies you've judged as required and what your staff, the competencies your staff currently hold, looking at any gaps, and then we can talk about how we fill those gaps in the next session. All right, if there's no more questions, I'll uh, say goodbye. And good luck for those of us that are going into level two on Thursday and getting our kids back. And, um, and probably better luck for Auckland where you still got some online learning to do. Thanks Fiona. Okay. Thanks Fiona. <laughs>